Welcome to the online course on the Nibbana Sermons 12 to 22 by Bhikkhu Katakurunda Nyanananda. A collaboration between the Numata Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Hamburg and the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies in Massachusetts. And today we are going to look at sermon number 21. But before that, just a few things from the online discussion. There's been a lot of uh, quoting from other writings of Venerable Yanananda. And that's just one here I wanted to take up. Mikens, he quotes from Seeing Through. As craving thins out, the fact of cessation becomes so the more clear. Because it is this very craving that has been concealing it all the time. Why do we say that craving is concealing the fact of cessation? Because craving is on the side of arising. As soon as cessation occurs, craving as the regenerator prompts a re-arising. And there were two comments uh, by participants on this craving topic. Hedwig Krenn. Craving is the invisible combustible fuel that keeps the raging sangsaric forest fire alive. And George Olea. Wildfires, the winds carrying flames across rivers and fire breaks. Flames taking leave of their fuel host taking flight on the wings of the winds, flames hungrily seeking, craving to reattach to a new fuel host, yet another material sponsor. Most dear craving indeed, Bhavanetti, intrepid guide to becoming. Let us start with Sermon 21. Etang santang etang panitang yadidang sabha sankara samatu sab upadi patinisago tanhakanka yogyarago nirodo nibbana. This is peaceful, this is excellent, namely the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. With the permission of the Most Venerable Great Preceptor and the Assembly of the Venerable Meditative Monks, this is the 21st sermon in the series of sermons on Nibbana. The other day we discussed to some extent the ten questions known as the ten indeterminate points, Dasa Abhyakadavattuni, which the Buddha laid aside, refusing to give a categorical answer as yes or no. We pointed out that the reason why he refused to answer them was the fact that they were founded on some wrong views, some wrong assumptions. To give categorical answers to such questions would amount to an assertion of those views. So he refrained from giving clear-cut answers to any of those questions. Already from our last sermon it should be clear to some extent how the eternalist and annihilationist views peep through them. The Tetralemma on the after-death state of the Tathagata, which is directly relevant to our theme, also presupposes the validity of those two extreme views. Had the Buddha given a categorical answer, he too would be committing himself to the presumptions underlying them. The middle path he promulgated to the world is one that transcended both those extremes. It is not a piecemeal compromise between them. He could have presented a halfway solution by taking up one or the other of the last two standpoints, namely that the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death, or the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. But instead of stooping to that position, 
he rejected the questionnaire in toto. On the other hand, he brought in a completely new mode of analysis, illustrative of the law of dependent arising, underlying the doctrine of the Four Noble Truths, in order to expose the fallacy of those questions. The other day, we happened to mention the conclusive answer given by the Buddha to the question raised by the wandering ascetic Vachagotta in the Agni Vachagotta Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya concerning the after-death state of the Tathagata. But we had no time to discuss it at length. Therefore, let us take it up again. When the wandering ascetic Vachagotta had granted the incongruity of any statement to the effect that the extinguished fire has gone in such and such a direction, and the fact that the term Nibbana is only a reckoning or a turn of speech, the Buddha follows it up with the conclusion, Eva meva ko vacha, yena rupena tathagatang panya payamana panya paya, tang rupang tathagatas pahinang utnchinna mulang tala vandukatang anabhavakatang ayating anampada dhammang, rupa sankhavi mundo ko vacha tathagato, gambhiro abbameyo dumpario gaho, Sayatapi Mahasamundo, Upanjadidi na Upeti, Na Upanjadidi na Upeti, Upanjadi cha na cha Upanjadidi na Upeti, Neva Upanjadi na na Upanjadidi na Upeti. Even so, Vacha, that form by which one designating the Tathagata might designate him, that has been abandoned by him, cut off at the root made like an uprooted palm tree, made non-existent and incapable of arising again. The Tathagata is free from reckoning in terms of form vajra. He is deep, immeasurable and hard to fathom, like the great ocean. To say that he is reborn falls short of a reply. To say that he is not reborn falls short of a reply. To say that he is both reborn and is not reborn falls short of a reply. To say that he is neither reborn nor is not reborn falls short of a reply. Comment, uh, translation by Nyanamoli. So too, Vajra, the Tathagata has abandoned that material form by which one describing the Tathagata might describe him. He has cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, done away with it so that it is no longer subject to future arising. The Tathagata is liberated from reckoning in terms of material form vajra. He is profound, immeasurable, hard to fathom like the ocean. He reappears, does not apply. He does not reappear, does not apply. He both reappears and does not reappear, does not apply. He neither reappears nor does not reappear, does not apply. And here I have the Chinese uh, text. So it says also that uh, four aggregates have already been abundant and known to be abundant, cut off at the root like a palm tree, which cannot arise again in the future. And then it brings in the four direction. So that is uh, not uh, referring back to the fire simile, that is not gone into any of the four directions. And although it does not explicitly mention the ocean, it has the deep, vast, boundless, uncountable, and forever ceased. So it has the same qualities, even though it does not explicitly mention the ocean. End of comment. <clears throat> As in the case of the aggregate of form, so also with regard to the aggregates of feeling, perception, preparations, and consciousness. That is to say, in regard to all the five aggregates of grasping, the Buddha made this particular declaration. From this it is clear that in this dispensation the Tathagata cannot be reckoned in terms of any of the five aggregates. The similes reveal to us the state of the Tathagata, the simile of the uprooted tree, for instance, 
on seeing a palm tree uprooted, but somehow left standing, one would mistake it for a growing palm tree. The worldling has a similar notion of the Tathagatan. This simile of the tree reminds us of the Isidatta Theragata, which has an allusion to it. Panchakam kanda parinyata titantanti chinnamulaka dukkha kayo anupatto patto me asava kayo. Five aggregates now fully understood just stand cut off at their root. Reach this suffering's end, extinct for me are influxes. Common translation by Kerr Norman. The five elements of existence, being known, stand with root cut off. I have obtained the annihilation of pain. I have attained the annihilation of the asavas. End of comment. On reaching Arahanthood, one finds oneself in this strange situation. The occurrence of the word Sankha in this connection is particularly significant. This word came up in our discussion of the term Papancha in the context Papancha Sankha and Papancha Sanya Sankha. There we had much to say about the word. It is synonymous with Samanya appellation and Panyati designation. Reckoning appellation and designation are synonymous to a great extent. So the concluding statement of the Buddha, already quoted, makes it clear that the Tathagata cannot be reckoned or designated in terms of form, though he has form. He cannot be reckoned by feeling, though he experiences feeling. Nor can he be reckoned by or identified with the aggregates of perceptions, preparations or consciousness. Now, in order to make a reckoning or a designation, there has to be a duality, a dichotomy. We had occasion to touch upon this normative tendency to dichotomize. By way of illustration, we may refer to the fact that even the price of an article can be reckoned, so long as there is a vortex between supply and demand. There has to be some kind of vortex between two things for there to be a designation. A vortex, or vatta, is an alternation between two things, a cyclic interrelation. A designation can come in only so long as there is such a cyclic process. Now the Tathagata is free from this duality. We have pointed out that the dichotomy between consciousness and name and form is the samsaric vortex. Let us refresh our memory of this vortex by alluding to a quotation from the Udana which we brought up on an earlier occasion. <coughs> Chinnang vattang navattati esi vanto dukkhasan. The world will cut off worlds no more. This even this is suffering's end. A common translation by Ireland. The severed round does not revolve. This is the end of suffering. End of comment. This in fact is a reference to the Arahant. The vortex is between consciousness and name and form. By letting go of name and form, and realizing the state of non-manifestative consciousness, the Arant has, in this very life, realized the cessation of existence, which amounts to a cessation of suffering as well. Though he continues to live on, he does not grasp any of those aggregates tenaciously. His consciousness does not get attached to name and form. That is why it is said that the vortex turns no more. To highlight this figure of the vortex, we can bring up another significant quotation from the Upadana Parivatta Sutta and the Satatthana Sutta of the Sanyutta Nikaya. Yesu vimutta te kevalino, ye kevalino vattang te sangnati panyapanaya. Those who are fully released are truly alone, and for them who are truly alone, there is no whirling round for purposes of designation. The statement might sound rather queer. The term Kevali occurs not only in the Samyutta Nikaya, but in the Sutta Nipata as well, with reference to the Arahant. Comment the term Kevali is also widely used in the Jain tradition as a term for the fully uh, realized one according to Jain understanding. End of comment. The commentary to the Sutta Nipata, Paramatta Jyotika, gives the following definition to the term when it comes up in the Kasi Bharat Bhaja Sutta. 
Sambaguna Paripunnang Samba Yoga Visangyuttang Va. According to the commentator, this term is used for the Arahant in the sense that he is perfect in all virtues, or else that he is released from all bonds. But going by the implications of the word Vatta associated with it, we may say that the term has a deeper meaning. From the point of view of etymology, the word Kivali is suggestive of singularity, full integration, aloofness and solitude. We spoke of a letting go of name and form. The non-manifestative consciousness released from name and form is indeed symbolic of the Arahant's singularity, wholeness, aloofness and solitude. In the following verse from the Dhammapada, which we had quoted earlier too, this release from name and form is well depicted. Kodang jahe vipan jahe yamanang sangyo janang sabbang atikkameya tang nama rupasminga sajjamanang akinchanang nanupatanti dukkha Let one put wrath away and conceit abandon and get well beyond all fetters as well. That one untrammeled by name and form with naught as his own, no pains before. Common translation by Norman. One should abandon anger. One should give up pride. One should pass beyond every attachment. Sufferings do not befall one who is not attached to name and form, possessing nothing. End of comment. We came across another significant reference to the same effect in the Marga Sutta of the Sutta Nipad. Yega satta vicharanti loke akinchanna kevali no yatatta kalena te suhabhyang pavetche yo brahmana punya pekoya jetha They who wander unattached in the world, owning not, aloof, restrained, to them in time let the Ramin offer that oblation, if merit be his aim. Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Those who wander unattached in the world, owning nothing, consummate, self-controlled, a Brahmin who would sacrifice intent on merit should make a timely oblation to them. End of comment. This verse also makes it clear that the freedom from ownings and attachments is implicit in the term Kivali. It has connotations of full integrations and aloofness. The term Kivala, therefore, is suggestive of the state of release from that vortex. If, for instance, a vortex in the ocean comes to cease, can one ask where the vortex has gone? It would be like asking where the extinguished fire has gone. One might say that the vortex has joined the ocean, but that too would not be a proper statement to make. From the very outset, what in fact was there was the great ocean, so one cannot say that the vortex has gone somewhere, nor can one say that it is not gone. It is also incorrect to say that it has joined the ocean. A cessation of a vortex gives rise to such a problematic situation. So is this state called Kivali. What in short does it amount to? The vortex has now become the great ocean itself. That is the significance of the comparison of the emancipated one to the great ocean. The commentators do not seem to have paid sufficient attention to the implications of this simile. But when one thinks of the relation between the vortex and the ocean, it is as if the Arahant has become one with the ocean. But this is only a turn of speech. In reality, the vortex is merely a certain pervert state of the ocean itself. That perversion is now no more. It has ceased. It is because of that perversion that there was a manifestation of suffering. The cessation of suffering could therefore be compared to the cessation of the vortex, leaving only the great ocean as it is. Only so long as there is a whirling vortex can we point out a here and a there. In the vast ocean, boundless as it is, where there is a vortex or an eddy, we can point it out with a here or a there. Even so, in the case of the samsaric individual, as long as the whirling around is going on in the form of the vortex, there is a possibility of a designation or appellation as so-and-so. But once the vortex has ceased, there is actually nothing to identify with for purposes of designation. 
The most one can say about it is to refer to it as the place where vortex has ceased. Such is the case with the Tathagata tomb. Freedom from the duality is for him released from the vortex itself. We have explained on a previous occasion how a vortex comes to be, a current of water trying to go against the mainstream, when its attempt is foiled in clashing with the mainstream, gets thrown off and pushed back, but turns round to go whirling and whirling as a whirlpool. This is not the norm, this is something abnormal. Here is a perversion resulting from an attempt to do the impossible. This is how a thing called a vortex comes to be. The condition of the samsaric being is somewhat similar. What we are taught as the four perversions in the Dhamma describe these four pervert attitudes of a samsaric being, perceiving permanence in the impermanent, perceiving pleasure in the painful, perceiving beauty in the foul, perceiving a self in the not-self. The samsaric individual tries to forge ahead in existence, misled by these four pervert views. The result of that attempt is the vortex between consciousness and name and form, a recurrent process of whirling round and round. Because of this process of whirling round, as in a vortex, there is an unreality about this world. What for us appears as the true and real state of the world, the Buddha declares to be false and unreal. We have already quoted on an earlier occasion the verse from the Dvayata Anupassana Sutta of the Sutta Nipada, which clearly illustrates this point. Anatani Atamaning Passa Lokang Sadevakang Nyetang Nama Rupasming Idang Satchanti Manyati. Just see the world with all its gods, fencing a self where none exists. Entrenched in name and form it holds the conceit that this is real. Common translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Behold the world together with its devas, conceiving a self in what is non-self. Settled upon name and form, they conceive this is true. End of comment. What the world entrenched in name and form takes to be real, it seems, is unreal, according to this verse. This idea is reinforced by the following refrain-like phrase in the Uruga Sutta of the Sutta Nipata. Sabang vita tang idanti nyatva loke, knowing that everything in this world is not such. We have referred to the special significance of the Uruga Sutta on several occasions. That discourse enjoins a giving up of everything, like the sloughing off of a worn out skin by a serpent. Now a serpent sheds its worn out skin by understanding that it is no longer the real skin. Similarly, one has to understand that everything in the world is not such. Tatha is such. Whatever is as it is, is yatha bhuta. To be as it is, is to be such. What is not as it is, is a yatha or bi tatha. Unsuch or not such, that is to say it is unreal. It seems, therefore, that the vortex whirling between consciousness and name and form in the case of some psychic beings is something not such. It is not the true state of affairs in the world. To be free from this aberration, this unreal state of duality, is to be an arahant. The three unskillful mental states of greed, hate and delusion are the outcome of this duality itself. So long as the whirling goes on, there is friction manifesting itself, sometimes as greed and sometimes as hate. Delusion impels and propels both. It is just one current of water that goes whirling round and round, bringing about friction and conflict. This interplay between consciousness and name and form is actually a pervert state, abnormal and unreal. To be a Tathagat is a return to reality and suchness from this unreal, unsuch, pervert state. We happened to mention earlier that the term Tathagata was already current among ascetics of other sects. But it is not in the same sense that the Buddha used this term. For those of other sects, the term Tathagata carried with it the prejudice of a soul or a self, even if it purported to, pre to represent the ideal of emancipation. But in this dispensation, the Tathagata is definitely defined differently. 
Tata, even so, thus, is the correlative of yata, just as in whatever way. At whatever moment it becomes possible to say that as is the ocean, so is the vortex now, then it is the state of Tathagata. The vortex originated by deviating from the course of the mainstream of the ocean. But if an individual, literally so called, gave up such pervert attitudes as seeing permanence in what is impermanent, if he got rid of the four perversions by the knowledge and insight into things as they are, then he comes to be known as a Tathagata. He is a thus gone, in the sense that, as is the norm of the world, thus he is now. There is also an alternative explanation possible etymologically. Tatata is a term for the law of dependent arising. It means thusness or suchness. This particular term, so integral to the understanding of the significance of Paticca Samapada or dependent arising, is almost relegated to the limbo in our tradition. Tathagata could therefore be alternatively explained as a return to that thusness or suchness by comprehending it fully. In this sense, the derivation of the term could be explained analytically as tata and agata. Comment here, I will come back to the etymology of uh, tathagata in relation to the next sermon. I have also a paper to offer on that. End of comment. Commentators, too, sometimes go for this etymology, though not exactly in this sense. According to this idea of a return to the true state of suchness, we may say that there is neither an increase nor decrease in the ocean when a vortex ceases. Why? Because what was found both inside the vortex and outside of it was simply water. So is the case with the samsaric individual. What we have to say from here onwards regarding the samsaric individual is directly relevant to meditation. As we mentioned on an earlier occasion, the four elements earth, water, fire and air are to be found both internally and externally. In the Maha Hatanti Padupama Sutta of the Madhima Nikaya, we come across a way of reflection that leads to insight in the following instructions. Ya cheva kopan ajhatika patavidhatu, ya cha bahira patavidhatu, patavidhatu reve sam. Tam ne tang mama, ne so ham asmi, nami so atantati, eva me tang, yatha bhutang, sam banyaya dat tambang. Now, whatever earth element that is internal, and whatever earth element that is external, both are simply earth element. That should be seen as it is with right wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Comment, translation by Jnana Moli. Now both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And this particular passage is not found in the Madhyama Agma parallel, which I have discussed in my comparative study of the Madhyama Nikaya, page 194. End of comment. The implication is that this so-called individual or person is in fact a vortex, formed out of the same kind of primary elements that obtain outside of it. So then, the whole idea of an individual or a person is a mere perversion. The notion of individuality in samsaric beings is comparable to the apparent individuality of a vortex. It is only a pretense. That is why it is called asmimana, the conceit M. In truth and fact, it is only a conceit. This should be clear when one reflects on how the pure air gets caught up into this vortex as an inbreath, only to be ejected after a while as a foul outbreath. Portions of primary elements, predominating in earth and water, get involved with this vortex as food and drink, to make a few rounds within, only to be exuded as dirty excreta and urine. This way, one can understand the fact that what is actually there is only a certain delimitation of measuring as internal and external. What sustains this process of measuring or reckoning is the duality, the notion that there are two things. So then the supreme deliverance in this dispensation is released from this duality. 
Release from this duality is at the same time release from greed and hate. Comment here. I just wanted to comment how powerful I found this whole vortex um, simile that the venerable has been bringing up now in earlier part and now here. <coughs> particularly if we relate it to actual meditation practice. Mm -hmm. So in a way we could say that like the breath is, uh, like say the breath is like taking one circle and uh, food and drink is taking several circles. And as long as this is not, uh, this does not come with desire or aversion with greed and hatred, then there is no pulling down it doesn't get it doesn't become a real vortex it's just a kind of i mean this is just my way of taking it it's just a circular motion on the surface of the water arans also eat and drink and breathe in and breathe out but as soon as this desire and aversion comes in it becomes it gets this 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 suction downward and this very suction is the cause of friction and then extending it to the senses eyes, ears, etc. So that seeing of forms, the hearing of sounds is still there in the case of the Arahant, but there is no desire and aversion. As soon as I react with desire or aversion, I am I am again creating this vortex. It becomes like substantial. And the more I pull it in, the more the suction, the stronger the suction, and the stronger the friction, the stronger the dukkha. And so at any moment, all that is needed is really to give up that, 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 that pulling motion, that, that circling motion, that suction, and, and let it just be all at the surface of the water. I found this a very powerful uh, simile of working in meditation practice with this tendency of desire and aversion to, to create this inner suction and the resulting friction. And also uh, interesting to uh, look at myself at what I am merely as a vortex. <coughs> End of comment. Ignorance is a sort of going round in a winding pattern, as in the case of a coil. Each round seems so different from the previous one. A peculiar novelty arising out of the forgetting or ignoring trait, characteristic of ignorance. However much one suffers in one life cycle, when one starts another life cycle with a new birth, one is in a new world, in a new form of existence. The sufferings in the previous life cycle are almost forgotten. The vast cycle of samsara, this endless faring round in time and space, is like a vortex. The vertical interplay between consciousness and name and form has the same background of ignorance. In fact, it is like the seed of the entire process. A disease is diagnosed by the characteristics of the germ. Even so, the Buddha pointed out that the basic principle underlying the samsadic vortex is traceable to the vertical interplay between consciousness and name and form going on within our minds. This germinal vortex between consciousness and name and form is an extremely subtle one that eludes the limitations of both time and space. This indeed is the timeless principle inherent in the law of paticca samapada or dependent arising. Therefore, the solution to the whole problem lies in the understanding of this law of dependent arising. We have mentioned on a previous occasion that the sankata or the prepared becomes asankata or the unprepared by the very understanding of the prepared nature of the sankata. The reason is that the prepared appears to be so due to the lack of understanding of its composite and prepared nature. This might well appear a riddle. The faring round in samsara is the result of ignorance. That is why final deliverance is said to be brought about by wisdom in this dispensation. All in all, an extremely important fact emerges from this discussion, namely the fact that the etymology attributed to the term Tathagata by the Buddha is highly significant. 
It effectively explains why he refused to answer the tetralemma concerning the after-death state of the Tathagata. When a vortex has ceased, it is problematic whether it has gone somewhere or joined the great ocean. Similarly, there is a problem of identity in the case of a Tathagata, even when he is living. This simile of the ocean gives us a clue to a certain much-vexed riddle-like discourse on Nibbana. Many of those scholars who put forward views on Nibbana with an eternalist bias count on the Paharada Sutta found among the eights of the Anguttara Nikaya. In fact, that discourse occurs in the Vinaya Chula Vagga and in the Uddana as well. In the Paharada Sutta, the Buddha gives a sustained simile explaining eight marvelous qualities of this dispensation to the Asura king Paharada by comparing them to eight marvels of the great ocean. The fifth marvelous quality is stated as follows. Sayyathapi paharada ya kachi loke savantiyo mahasamundang apventi ya kachi andalika dhara papatanti na tena mahasamundas unatangva puratangva panyayati eva meva ko paharada bahu chepi bhikku anuparisi saya nibbana dhatu ya paribayanti just as Paharada, however many rivers of the world may flow into the great ocean, and however much torrential downpours may fall on it from the sky, no decrease or increase is apparent in the great ocean. Even so, Paharada, although many monks may attain Parinibbana in the Nibbana element without residual clinging, Thereby, no decrease or increase is apparent in the Nibbana element. Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Just as whatever streams in the world flow into the great ocean, and however much rain falls on into it from the sky, neither decrease nor filling up can be seen in the great ocean. So too, even if many Bhikkhus attain final Nibbana by way of the Nibbana element without residue remaining, Neither decrease nor filling up can be seen in the Nibbana element. Yet the idea that there is no increase or decrease of the great ocean obviously uh, reflects the ancient Indian cosmology and knowledge of the planet. Nowadays we know that there is a, an increase uh, in the great ocean due to the uh, climatic change and the all the water that flows from the, 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 the on top of the mountains that are now melting. And for uh, it is interesting also for this simile that in the otherwise fairly similar presentation in the Madhyama Agama, uh, this idea is not there at all. The idea of comparing the Nibbana element with the ocean is not found in the Chinese parallel. End of comment. Quite a number <coughs> excuse me, quite a number of scholars draw upon this passage when they put forward the view that Arahants, after their death, find some place of refuge which never gets overcrowded. It is a ridiculous idea, utterly misconceived. It is incompatible with this Dhamma, which rejects both eternalist and annihilationist view. Such ideas seem to have been put forward due to a lack of appreciation of the metaphorical significance of this particular discourse and a disregard for the implications of this comparison of the Arahant to the great ocean in point of his suchness or tatata. In the light of these facts, we have to conclude that Nibbana is actually the truth and that samsara is a mere perversion. That is why the Dvayatthanupassana Sutta, from which we have quoted earlier too, is fundamentally important. It says that what the world takes as the truth, that the Aryans have seen with wisdom as untruth. Yang pare sukato ahum tat ariya ahu dukkato, yang pare dukkato ahum tat ariya sukato vidum. What others may call bliss, that the Aryans make known as pain. What others may call pain, that the Aryans have known to be bliss. And it effectively concludes Passa dhammang tu rajanang sampamul hetta avidnasu. 
Behold the norms so hard to grasp. Baffled herein are ignorant ones. And common translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. What others speak of as happiness, let the noble ones speak of as suffering. What others speak of as suffering, let the noble ones have known as happiness. Behold this Dhamma, hard to comprehend. Here the foolish are bewildered. End of comment. The truth of this profound declaration by the Buddha could be seen in these deeper dimensions of the meaning of Tathata. By way of further clarification of what we have already stated about the Tathagata and the mode of answering those questions about his after-death state, we may now take up the Anuradha Sutta of the Sanyata Nikaya, which is of paramount importance in this issue. <coughs> According to this discourse, when the Buddha was once dwelling in the gabled hall in Vesali, a monk named Anuradha was living in a hut in a jungle close by. One day he was confronted with a situation which shows that even a forest-dwelling monk cannot afford to ignore questions like this. A group of wandering ascetics of other sects approached him and, seated in front of him, made this pronouncement as if to see his response. Friend Anuradha, as to that Tathagata, the highest person, the supreme person, the one who has attained the supreme state, in designating him, one does so in terms of these four propositions. The Tathagata exists after death, the Tathagata does not exist after death, the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death, the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. When a Tathagata is describing a Tathagata, the highest type of person, the supreme person, the attainer of the supreme attainment, he describes him in terms of these four cases. The Tathagata exists after death, or the Tathagata does not exist after death, or the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death, or the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. End of comment. What those ascetics of other sects wanted to convey was that the state of the Tathagata after death could be predicated only by one of these four propositions, constituting the Tetralemma. But then when Anuradha made the following declaration as if to repudiate that view, Yosu avonsu Tathagata uttama puriso, parama puriso, parama patti patto, tang Tathagatang anyatri mehi chattui thani panya payamana panya peti. Friends, as to that Tathagata, the highest person, the supreme person, the one who has attained the supreme state, in designating him, one does so apart from these four propositions. <coughs> Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Friends, when a Tathagata is describing a Tathagata, the highest type of person, the supreme person, the attainer of the supreme attainment, he describes him apart from these four cases. Yeah, and then I have here the Chinese parallel, and it proceeds quite differently. They again ask Anuradha, how is this venerable one? Being asked, does the Tathagata after, exist after death? You reply that this is left undeclared. Being asked, does he not exist after death? You reply that this is left undeclared. Being asked, does he exist and not exist after death? That he neither exists nor non-exists. Reply that this is left undeclared. How is this venerable one? Is the breakfast Gotama without knowledge and without vision? Anurada said, the blessed one is not without knowledge, he is not without vision. So here in the Chinese one, Anurada has not taken up uh, uh, any kind of statement as he does in the in the Pali, but simply says this is left undeclared. And since it's not being declared, then the uh, others, the his visitors then think, well, then the, is the Buddha, the, the, does he simply not know? 
And this is, of course, a way of presentation uh, which uh, would by Anurada, which would very much accord with the uh, with the teachings. But uh, we also have a Sanskrit fragment, and it has preserved this Rama Purusha Parama Prapti Prapta Tangvain Anya Traiva. So even though this is just a short fraction, it shows that uh, speaking about the one who has uh, trained the, the Supreme Person, the one who has reached the Supreme, that one apart from, so uh, it seems that the uh, Sanskrit uh, fragment version had a similar formulation as the Pali, that he also, Anurada, makes a statement uh, in which he says, look, uh, apart from these four propositions one can designate the supreme person and it's quite possible that he may have had in mind uh, something like what Vachagota was reporting uh, from the debating hall in the passage taken up in the previous sermon this achechitan hang vavatai sang yojanang samamana abhisamaya antangakasi dukkasa that uh, it was known, it became known that the Buddha was not taking one of these four uh, uh, propositions, but rather was making the statement that uh, the uh, it cut off craving and uh, fetters uh, by rightly comprehending conceit uh, has made an end of dukkha. So perhaps that is what I'm just guessing, but that could be something Anurara had in mind. But of course, as we will see soon, he is getting, uh, he's not getting uh, a praise for that because his visitors immediately think that he is proposing something that is outside of the tetralemma. And that is impossible. I mean, you, you, as long as the premise is being accepted and Anurada in a way accepts their premise about what the Tathagata is by saying, okay, you can point this Tathagata out but apart from this form he is accepting that premise about the Tathagata and then you can't really escape the fourfold logic end of comment as soon as he made this statement <coughs> those ascetics of other sects <coughs> made the der derogatory remark this must be either a newcomer to the order, just comfort, or a foolish, incompetent, incompetent elder. <coughs> With this insult, they got up and left, and Venerable Anurada fell to thinking. If those wandering ascetics of other sects should question me further, how should I answer them creditably so as to state what has been said by the exalted one and not to misrepresent him? How should I explain in keeping with the norm of Dhamma so that there will be no justifiable occasion for impeachment? With his doubt in mind, he approached the Buddha and related the whole episode. The Buddha, however, instead of giving a short answer, led Venerable Anurada step by step to an understanding of the Dhamma catechetically by a wonderfully graded path. First of all, he convinced Venulanu Rada of the three characteristics of existence. Tanking Manasi Anurada, Rupang, Nichangva Nichangvati, Anichangvante. Yangpana Nichang Dukangva Tang Sukangvati, and Dukang Bhante. Yangpana Nichang Dukangkang Viparinama Dhammang, Kalangutang Samanopasitum, Etang Mama, Esam Asmi, Esami Atati, Nuhetang Bhante. What do you think, Anurada? Is form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this am I, this is myself? No, indeed, Venerable Sir. Comment translation by Bhikkhubodhi. What do you think, Anurada? Is form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, Venerable Sir. Therefore, seeing thus, he understands there is no more of his state of being, so he has abbreviated it. Samyukta Agama parallel. The Buddha said to Anurada, I will now ask you, answer according to my questions. Anurada, is bodily form permanent or is it impermanent? 
And the Buddha replied, it is impermanent. The Buddha asked again, is feeling, perception, formations, consciousness permanent or is it impermanent? And the Buddha replied, it is impermanent, blessed one. End of comment. So also with regard to the other aggregates, the Buddha guided Venerable Anuradha to the correct standpoint of the Dhamma, in this case by three steps, and this is the first step. He put aside the problem of the Tathagata for a moment and highlighted the characteristic of not-self out of the three signata, thereby convincing Anuradha that what is impermanent suffering and subject to change is not fit to be regarded as self. Now comes the second step, which is more or less a reflection leading to insight. <coughs> Tasmati anurada yam kinchi rupang atitanagata pachupanang ajhatang ba bahinda ba ularikang ba sukumang ba hinang ba panitang ba yam dure santikiva sabang rupang netang mama neso ham asmi Namiso atati, eva metam yatha bhotam sammapanyaya dattapam. Yakachi vidana atitana gata pachupanna, yakachi sanya yekechi sankara, yang kinche vinyan atitana gata pachupanna, achatang ba bahindava, ularikang ba, sukumang ba, hinang ba, panitang ba, yang dure santikeva, sabang vinyanang netang mama, neso ham asmi, namiso atati. Eva metang yata bhotang sama panyaya dattabhang. Evang pasang anurada sutava arya savako upas ming pinip bindati vidanaya pinip bindati sanyaya pinip bindati sankhare su pinip bindati vinyana sming pinip bindati nim bindang viranjati viragavi mochati vimutta sming vimuttam iti nyanang hoti kina jati vositang brahmacharyang Katankarniyam napang itattayati pajanati. Therefore, Anurada, any kind of form whatsoever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all forms should be seen as it really is with right wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Any kind of feeling whatsoever, whether past, future or present, any kind of perception, any kind of preparations, any kind of consciousness whatsoever, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all consciousness should be seen as it really is with right wisdom thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Seeing thus Anurada, the instructed noble disciple gets disgusted of form gets disgusted of feeling, gets disgusted of perception, gets disgusted of preparations, gets disgusted of consciousness. With disgust he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion his mind is liberated. When it is liberated there comes the knowledge it is liberated, and he understands extinct is birth, lived is the holy life, done is what is to be done, there is no more of this state of being. Here the Buddha is presenting a mode of reflection that culminates in Arandhum. If one is prepared to accept the not-self standpoint, then what one has to do is to see with right wisdom all the five aggregates as not-self in a most comprehensive manner. This is the second step. Now as the third step, the Buddha sharply addresses a series of questions to Venul Anurada to judge how he would determine the relation of the Tathagata, or the Emancipated One, to the Five Aggregates. <coughs> what do you think, Anuradha? Do you regard form as the Tathagata? No, Venerable Sir. Do you regard feeling, perception, preparations, consciousness as the Tathagata? No, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Anuradha? Do you regard the Tathagata as in form? No, Venerable Sir. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from form? No, Venerable Sir. Do you regard the Tathagata as in feeling? No, Venerable Sir. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from feeling? No, Venerable Sir. Do you regard the Tathagata as in perception? No, Venerable Sir. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from perception? No, Venerable Sir. Do you regard the Tathagata as in preparations? No, Venerable Sir. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from preparations? No, Venerable Sir. Do you regard the Tathagata as in consciousness? No, Venerable Sir. 
do you regard the Tathagata as, apart from consciousness? No, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Anuradha? Do you regard the Tathagata as one who is without form, without feeling, without perception, without preparations, without consciousness? No, Venerable Sir. Comment? Translation by Bikaboni. What do you think, Anuradha? Do you regard form as the Tathagata? No, Venerable Sir. Do you regard feeling, perception, volitional formations, consciousness as the Tathagata? No, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Anuradha? Do you regard the Tathagata as in form? No, Venerable Sir. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from form? No, Venerable Sir. Do you regard the Tathagata as in feeling, as apart from feeling, as in perception, as apart from perception, as in volitional formation, as apart from volitional formations, as in consciousness, as apart from consciousness? No, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Anuradha? Do you regard form, feeling, perception, volitional formation and consciousness taken together as the Tathagata? No, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Anuradha? Do you regard the Tathagata as one who is without form, without feeling, without perception, without volitional formations, without consciousness? No, Venerable Sir. And here is the Chinese parallel, which is uh, supplemented from an earlier discourse as it abbreviates. How is it? Is bodily form the Tathagata? No, Venerable Sir. Is feeling, perception, formations, consciousness the Tathagata? No, Venerable Sir. How is it? Is the Tathagata distinct from bodily form? Is the Tathagata distinct from feeling, perception, formations, consciousness? No, Venerable Sir. Is the Tathagata in bodily form? Is the Tathagata in feeling, perception, formation, consciousness? No, Venerable Sir. Is bodily form in the Tathagata? Is feeling, perception, formations, consciousness in the Tathagata? No, Venerable Sir. Is the Tathagata without bodily form, feeling, perception, formations, consciousness? No, Venerable Sir. <coughs> End of comment. When Venerable Anurana gives negative answers to all these four modes of questions, the Buddha draws the inevitable conclusion that accords with the Dhamma. Etta chiti anuradha dittiva dhamme satchato tetato tathagate anupalabhya mane kalanu tetang be ya karanang yoso avoso tathagato uttama puriso parama puriso parama patti patto tang tathagatang anyatri me hi chattu ithane panya paya mano panya peti no hetang bhante. So then anuradha, when for you tathagata is not to be found in truth and fact here in this very life. Is it fitting for you to declare, as you did, friends, as to the Tathagata, the highest person, the supreme person, the one who has attained the supreme state? In designating him, one does so apart from these four propositions. No, Venerable Sir. Comment? Translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. But, Anuradha, when the Tathagata is not apprehended by you as real and actual here in this very life, is it fitting for you to declare... Friends, when a Tathagata is describing a Tathagata, the highest type of person, the Supreme Person, the attainer of the Supreme Attainment, he describes him apart from these four cases, the Tathagata exists after death, or the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death, no venerable sir. And the Chinese parallel, in this way, the Tathagata as existing truly here and now cannot be gotten at anywhere, cannot be designated anywhere. Anuradha, if one leaves behind what the Tathagata has done and claims he is without knowledge and vision, then this is not correctly spoken. Yeah, this uh, goes back to the different way the Chinese version is proceeding as it is this uh, uh, countering the allegation by the visitors that by not taking any of the four positions, the Buddha must be without knowledge and without vision. End of comment. This conclusion, namely that the Tathagata is not to be found in truth and fact even in this very life, is one that drives terror into many who are steeped in the craving for existence. But this, it seems, is the upshot of the Catechism. The rebuke of the wandering ascetics is justifiable, because the Tetralemma exhausts the universe of discourse, and there is no way out. The Buddha's reproof of Anuradha amounts to an admission that even here and now the Tathagata does not exist in truth and fact, not to speak of his condition hereafter. When Anuradha accepts this position, the Buddha expresses his approbation with the words Sadhu Sadhu Anuradha, 
Pobbechanganu rada etara echa dukkan cheva panya pemi dukkha sucha nirudan. Gun gunanu rada. Formerly as well as now, I make known just suffering and the cessation of suffering. This declaration makes it clear that the Four Noble Truths are the teaching proper and that terms like Tathagata, Sakta and Pukkala are mere concepts. No doubt this is a disconcerting revelation. So let us see whether there is any possibility of salvaging the Tathagata. Now there is the word Upalabhati occurring in this context which is supposed to be rather ambiguous. In fact, some prefer to render it in such a way as to mean that Tathagata does exist, only that he cannot be traced. Tathagata, it seems, exists in truth and fact, though one cannot find him. This is the way they get round the difficulty. But then let us examine some of the contexts in which the word occurs, to see whether there is a case for such an interpretation. A clear-cut instance of the usage of this expression comes in the Vajira Sutta of the Samyutta Nikaya. The Arahant non Vajira addresses the following challenge to Maran. Kinnu sato di pancesi mara dittigatannu te suddha sankara punyo yam nairang sattu What do you mean by a being, Mara? Isn't it a bigoted view on your part? This is purely a heap of preparations, mind you. No being is to be found here at all. Comment translation by Bikobodi. Why not do you assume a being, Mara? Is that your speculative view? This is a heap of sheer formations. Here no being is found. And here's the Chinese version. There's a, the, the names, there's a... Uh, instead of Bajira, this is attributed to Sela. This uh, seems to be a confusion of names, either in the Chinese or in the Pali tradition. We are not sure. You're speaking of the existence of a being. This then is just evil Mara's view. There's only a collection of empty aggregates. There is no being as such. And this is also the reading I am going to offer for this lecture. It's a study of uh, the whole Bhikkhuni Sangyutta from the Chinese and how all of these Arahant Bhikkhunis are defying Mara. And it also has some reflections on the nature of Mara and what these uh, challenges by Mara imply. Because this is sometimes misunderstood in my view as if it uh, Mara is always reflecting inner defilements or problems. But it's impossible that, for example, when Mara challenges whether it's now Sela or Vajira, uh, fully awakened Bhikkhuni with this Sattā, with this living being uh, issue, that this is, should then be read as meaning that she is somehow not clear on the issue. And this is definitely not the case. Then uh, the, an, an Arahant knows that uh, there is no substantial permanent entity and so that any term sattā, tathāgata, whatever it is can only refer to a process to something conditioned uh, a being only in the sense of something that is not a permanent, unchanging entity and so in such contexts like this one and in others Mara represents challenges made by others in the ancient Indian context, challenges that come from the outside, Mara does not invariably stay for inner uncertainties. And this is an important point to keep in mind because some have even gone so far as to say that when Mara uh, challenges the Buddha, then this means the Buddha was not fully awakened and he was in doubt and uncertain. And this is, this is just a serious misunderstanding of the significance of Mara in early Buddhism. And so for those of you who are interested, then there, this article will clarify this issue. End of comment. The context as well as the tone makes it clear that the word upalabhati definitely means not to be found. Not that there is a being, but one cannot find it. We may take up another instance from the Pura Bheda Sutta of the Sutta Nipata, where the theme is the Arahant. 
Nathasapupta Pasavu Va Kettang Vatantunga Vinjati Atang Bapi Niratang Va Natas Mingupalamade. Not for him are sons and cattle, he has no field or site to build. In him there is not to be found anything that is grasped or given up. Common translation by Bikabodhi. He has no sons or cattle, nor does he possess fields or land. In him there is nothing to be found as either taken up or rejected. End of comment. The words Attang and Nirattang are suggestive of the dichotomy from which the Arahant is free. The context unmistakably proves that the expression Naupalabhati means not to be found. All this goes to show that the Buddha set aside the four questions forming the tetralemma, not because they are irrelevant from the point of view of Nibbana, despite the fact that he could have answered them. That is to say, not that he could not, but that he would not. How can one say that the question of an Arahant's after-death state is totally irrelevant? So that is not the reason. The reason is that the questions are misleading. Those who posed these questions had the presumption that the word Tathagata implied a truly existing being or a person. But the Buddha pointed out that the concept of a being or a person is fallacious. Though it is fallacious, for the worldling living in an illusory, unreal world, it has its place as a relative reality. Due to the very fact that it is grasped, it is binding on him. Therefore, when a worldling uses such terms as I and mine, or a being and a person, it is not a mere way of expression, it is a level of reality proper to the worldling's scale of values. And yeah, I find this very opposite remark for reflection. End of comment. But for the Arahans who have reached the state of suchness, it is a mere concept. In fact, it becomes a mere concept in the context of the simile of the vortex and the ocean. That is to say, in the case of the Arahans, their five aggregates resemble the flotsam and jetsam on the surface waters of a vortex already seized at its depth. On seeing the Buddha and the Arahans, one might still say, as a way of saying, here is the Buddha, here are the Arahans. For the Buddha, the concept of a being is something incompatible with his teaching from beginning to end. But for the nonce, he had to use it, as is evident from many a discourse. The expression Atta, Arya, Puggala, the eight noble persons, includes the Arahant as well. Similarly, in such context as the Aganga Pasada Sutta, the term Satta is used indiscriminately, giving way to conventional usage. Yavata bhikkave satta apadava dipadava chatupadava bahupadava urupinova arupinova sanyinova asanyinova neva sanyi na sanyinova tathagrute sang angamakhayati arhang samma sambundho Monks, whatever kind of beings they be, whether footless or two footed or four footed or many footed, with form or formless, percipient or non percipient, or neither percipient nor non percipient, among them the Tathagata, worthy and fully awakened, is called supreme. <coughs> translation by comment, translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. To whatever extent <coughs> there are beings, whether footless or with two foot, four foot, feet or many feet, whether having form or formless, whether percipient or non-percipient, or neither percipient or non-percipient, the Tathagata, the Arahant, the perfectly enlightened one, is declared the foremost among them. And here is the Chinese parallel, and it has the, basically the same statement. End of comment. Although the term Satta occurs here, it is only by way of worldly parlance. In truth and fact, however, there is no being as such. In a previous sermon, we happened to mention a new etymology given by the Buddha to the term loka, a world. In the same way, he advanced a new etymology for the term satta. As mentioned in the Radha Sangyutta of the Sangyutta Nikaya, Venema Radha once posed the following question to the Buddha. Satto satto di bhante vuchati, kitintavatanu ko bhante satto di vuchati. Venema, sir, it is said a being, a being. 
to what extent can one be called a being? Then the Buddha explains, Rupe, Vedanaya, Sanyaya, Sankaresu, Vinyane, Ko, Rada, Yuchando, Yorago, Yanandi, Yatanha, Tatra Satto, Tatra Visatto, Tasma Satoti, Vuchati. Rada, that desire, that lust, that delight, that craving in form, feeling, perception, preparations, consciousness, which, which one is attached and thoroughly attached to it. Therefore is one called a being. Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. One is stuck, Radha, tightly stuck, in desire, lust, delight and craving for form. Therefore one is called a being. One is stuck, tightly stuck, in desire, lust, delight and craving for feeling, for perception, for volitional formations, for consciousness. Therefore one is called a being. And the, <coughs> and the Chinese parallel, being defiled by attachment to and entangled in with bodily form, this is called a living being. Being defiled by attachment to and entangled with feeling, perception, formation and consciousness, this is called a living being. End of comment. Here the Buddha is punning on the word sattā, which has two meanings, a being and the one attached. The etymology, etymology attributed to that word by the Buddha brings out in sharp relief the attachment as well. Whereas in his redefinition of the term loka, he followed an etymology that stresses the disintegrating nature of the world. Sato visato tasma sato di Attached, thoroughly attached, therefore is one called a being. Having given this new definition, the Buddha follows it up with a scintillating simile. Suppose, rather, some little boys and girls are playing with sandcastles. So long as their lust, desire, love, thirst, passion and craving for those things have not gone away, they remain fond of them, they play with them, treat them as their property and call them their own. But when rather those little boys and girls have outgrown that lust, desire, love, thirst, passion and craving for those sandcastles, they scatter them with their hands and feet, demolish them, dismantle them and render them unplayable. Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. It is just as if in a village small boys and small girls play by gathering earth to construct a city with walls and houses. Their minds delight in it with craving and they are attached to it. As long as their craving for it is not eradicated, their desire for it is not eradicated, their thinking fondly of it is not eradicated, their thirst for it is not eradicated, their minds continue to crave for it with delight protecting it by saying, this is my walled city and these are my houses. If their craving for that assemblage of earth is eradicated, their desire for it is eradicated, and their thinking fondly of it is eradicated, their thirst for it is eradicated, they push it over with their hands or kick it over with their feet so that it becomes scattered. And here's the Chinese parallel. It is just as if in a village small boys and small girls play by gathering earth to construct a city with walls and houses. Their minds delight in it with craving and they are attached to it. As long as their craving for it is not eradicated, their desire for it is not eradicated, their thinking fondly of it is not eradicated, their thirst for it is not eradicated, their mind continues to crave for it with delight, protecting it by saying, this is my walled city and these are my houses. If their craving for that assemblage of earth is eradicated, their desire for it is eradicated, their thinking fondly of it is eradicated, their thirst for it is eradicated, they push it over with their hands or kick it over with their feet so that it becomes scattered. End of comment. Nor comes the Buddha's admonition based on the simile. Eva meva korada, tumhe, rupang, vedanang, sanyang, sankhare, vinyanang, vikirata. Vidhamata, Vidhangsita, Nikilanika, Karuta, Tanakkayaya Patipanjata. Even so, Radha, you are, you are scattered from feeling, perception, preparations, consciousness, demolish it, dismantle it, render it unplayable, practice for the destruction of craving. 
and then he winds up with that highly significant conclusive remark, Tanaka yohi rada nibbanam, for the destruction of craving rada is nibbanam. Comment, uh, translation by Bikaboni. So too, Radha, scatter from, demolish it, shatter it, put it out of play, practice for the destruction of craving. Scatter feeling, scatter perception, scatter volition of formations, scatter consciousness, demolish it, shatter it, put it out of play, practice for the destruction of craving. For the destruction of craving, Radha, is Nibbana. And the Chinese? In the same way, Radha, craving for bodily form, is to be broken up, destroyed, made to disappear and extinguished. Craving for feeling, perception, formations, consciousness is to be broken up, destroyed, made to disappear and extinguished. Because of the eradication of craving, Dukkha is eradicated. I say that because of the eradication of Dukkha, all makes an end of Dukkha. <laughs>